Welcome back, everyone, to another video. I'm Dr. Matthew Hale, and this is a primer on Karl Marx and Marxist theory. Now, before we get started, please subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment, even share the video if you can. It really helps me and motivates me to continue growing the channel. Okay, over the last, I don't know, four or five years or so, essentially the kickoff of the 2016 election, you've likely heard the term Marxist or radical liberal Marxist or a number of other terms and phrases that employ but don't understand anything about Marxism, socialism, or communism. Oftentimes, all of these terms are used interchangeably, incoherently, and incorrectly. What I'm trying to get at here is that while hearing the word Marxism might instantly make your heart race, whether in anger or excitement, please just reserve your judgment until you've actually watched the video. And let me be perfectly clear, I don't care if you like or agree with Karl Marx. In fact, I don't care if you think everything he's ever said was stupid or wrong or pure perfection. I don't want you to think of him as a saint or some sort of cartoonish evil demon-like figure. Also, speaking of demons, check out this monster demon thing that I photoshopped Marx's head onto, as well as the Communist Manifesto on this book that he was originally holding in the painting. It's from this medieval painting by Michael Pasher, I think is how you pronounce it, entitled The Devil Presenting St. Augustine with the Book of Vices and it has, as you very well may have noticed, a face on its butt, or rather its butt is a face, and that is amazing. I have so many questions, all of them logistical. It's a very cat-dog-like conundrum to be in. Does the butt have independent thought and feelings, or are they a single entity? Anyway, I feel like we veered off topic a bit because of the whole face-butt demon thing and the general sort of public misunderstanding of Marxist ideas. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna just redo this here, and we're gonna have a different kind of energy. Let's just do a hard reset. Welcome to Karl Marx Presents Karl Marx's Marxism Extravaganza featuring Karl Marx and... Frederick Engels. So before we talk about his ideas, we need to know a bit about who Marx was, just as a living, breathing human being. Karl was born in Trier, Germany in 1818 in the midst of the Industrial Revolution. You can actually go visit the Karl Marx house. You could pre-COVID and theoretically you can after. The home is now a museum. It's quite beautiful, actually. Just for reference, here it is on Google Maps. We'll just zoom in here and zoom in a few more times. There we go, we'll just drop our little yellow icon guy there to get the street view. And, uh, looks kind of menacing, actually, now that you, now you kind of think about it. All right, where were we? Yes, Marx facts. Marx so facts. Marx is one of those folks that if he lived today and had an Instagram account, though I doubt he would, his profile would have a lot of hyphens. He was a philosopher, an economist, sociologist, a journalist, and a revolutionary. Marx is one of the most influential thinkers of the 20th century, and his name frequently appears as the number one entry in the most cited scholars in both the humanities and social sciences. Marx was a prolific author and thinker. He published a lot of books, both in his lifetime and many posthumously through his BFF author, businessman, philosopher, and activist, Frederick Engels. So I just want to highlight a few works that are particularly relevant to some of the ideas that we're going to be discussing later in this video. First, there's the Communist Manifesto that Marx co-authored with Engels in 1848. Then there's the absolutely ginormous Das Kapital, which appears in three volumes. These texts were published between 1867 and 1894, the final volume being published just over a decade after Marx's death. And finally, there's Grundrisse, which translates into English from German into something like floor plans or an outline. It essentially was a rough draft for what would eventually become Das Kapital. Grundrisse was published in 1939, but was originally written sometime around 1857, 1858. If you're interested in learning more about Karl's life, I'd recommend you check out the Karl Marx episode of Genius of the Modern World on Netflix. It's a pretty good show, and you can learn more about who he was and what motivated him. Okay, so now you know a bit, and I do mean a bit, about Karl Marx, let's move on from Marx as a human being to consider his contributions to social theory. Over the next few minutes, I'd like to provide a quick overview of five of Marx's ideas. They are historical materialism, use value versus exchange value, class struggle, commodity fetishism, and Marx's theory of alienation. All right, so let's jump right into the thick of it, into theory and concepts, starting with historical materialism. But before we do, a brief word from our sponsors. You shitty hamburgers don't have class consciousness. Just let the bourgeoisie run everything hamburger. Thanks, sponsors. Historical materialism is a methodology or an orientation. Marx argued that societies and their development through history was the result of material conditions rather than ideals. That social life, behaviors, values, norms, power structures, the organization and development of society as a whole, in other words, was determined by the material world and economic activity. 
And accordingly, Marx argued that in order to study any sort of text or social practice, that those social formations ought to be analyzed in relation to the historical and material conditions that gave rise to them and that framed them in the present. This brings us to use value and exchange value. Okay, let's start by defining what a commodity is. A commodity is a good or a service that is produced by and through human labor that is then offered up on the market. Now, Marx distinguishes between two kinds of value of a commodity. There's what he calls use value on the one hand and exchange value on the other. Let me explain. So use value has to do with the tangible qualities of a commodity. Think of it as utility or function. It's the physical features of a commodity that satisfies a human need or requirement. This gets clearer with an example. So let's take wheat, for instance. The use value of wheat is that you can turn it into food and eat it. It satisfies that most basic of human needs, food. Here's another example, a coat. The use value of this fancy looking double-breasted top coat is that it clothes and keeps one warm. It's what the commodity's physical properties accomplish for a human being. Now this brings us to exchange value. So back to wheat for a second. While a farmer, let's say, could eat their wheat, which is a funny sentence, she or he could also grow and harvest wheat that they then offer up for other buyers. In other words, they sell the wheat. So that's exchange value. Okay, so let's return back to that coat to consider its exchange value. Its use value is that it clothes and warms and perhaps imparts style or whatever, but you could also exchange the coat with someone for something else. If someone walked up to you and said, hey, I've got three eggs that my chicken laid, would you exchange it for that coat? Let's say you paid $400 for it or you made it entirely from scratch and raw materials. You'd likely say, no thanks. You'd probably reason that the coat is worth way more than three eggs. Marx argues that the value of the coat is sort of distilled in the human labor that went into creating it. This can all get rather complicated and it's worth reading Marx himself here, but let me just boil this all down to the very, very basics. Use value is the function or utility of a commodity and exchange value is the ability of a commodity to be exchanged for other seemingly commensurable commodities. Now life would get rather complicated if you think about it. Every single time that you needed some good that you had to kind of figure out what the relative worth of, let's say, your coat is in terms of other goods for direct barter or exchange. A case in point, how many nice coats would you need to equal the cost of a gently used 1996 Toyota Corolla? Or how many hammers? Or pogs? Remember pogs? Or vegan chicken nuggets? This is where the money form comes in, so that you and the seller can agree on an amount of money rather than coming back with some sort of figure of I don't know how many fancy men's coats. Money is an arbitrary symbol, but it has value because we believe and instill in it a sense of value. Okay, so now on to class struggle. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels wrote that the history of all hitherto existing human society is a history of class struggles. In other words, for Marx, history is the history of struggle, of a conflict between those who have and those who don't. Now again, it's a lot more complicated than that. This is a primer. Remember, if you're interested in these ideas, you're going to need to learn about what Marx calls labor power, surplus value, ideology, base and superstructure, the means and modes of production, class consciousness, that's a good one, all that stuff. A lot of folks who know nothing about Marxism just distill it down to Marx hates capitalism. Boo! You suck, boo! That's fair, but that's not exactly the whole picture. He was extremely impressed by the efficiency of capitalism, of its ability to quickly generate massive amounts of goods. But he also thought that capitalism would fail and eventually tear itself apart because of all of its internal contradictions. And that the workers, the proletariat, would achieve class consciousness, rise up, and that eventually capitalism would be replaced with what he viewed as a utopian world of communism in which, in his mind, everyone would work together to meet everyone's needs and the needs of society. So to get back to Marx's view and critique of capitalism, he believed that capitalism was built on exploitation. The rich and powerful exploited the workers who didn't own the means of production. They had nothing to sell on the market essentially except for themselves, their time, their capacity to labor, what he called labor power. Literally their life force to the capitalist who used them to create excess value for themselves. In this endless pursuit of more and more and more money, it wasn't really about meeting a need, finding a use value, but rather just generating endless profit. In short, exploitation wasn't a bug of capitalism, it was a feature. And this brings us to what Marx called commodity fetishism. Now when you hear this phrase, you might think, fetishism, what does that have to do with commodities or the organization of social life or the economy? But it's not that fetishism, let me, let me explain that one. 
In a capitalist society, it feels innate, natural, or even inevitable that commodities that we see lining the shelves at a retail store, well, it's as if they just mysteriously appear and exist as if by magic and have an inherent monetary value. This is because much, if not all, of the labor that went into designing, creating, shipping, marketing, and stocking the item before us is rendered invisible. All of this human labor is obfuscated, and we no longer see purchasing a MacBook, an action figure, or a television as an exchange between real material human beings with complex complex lives and desires and histories, but rather as a relationship between things. This might seem pretty familiar or just plain obvious, frankly, to you if you've ever worked as a waiter or a cashier in a retail environment. Customers can be extremely impersonal, rude, weird, or downright cruel. And again, that's due at least in part because within the capitalistic system, many folks don't view the economic relations as real human relationships, but rather as a system of objects. This seems to give folks a license to treat cashiers and waiting staff as non-human or subhuman entities because they are functions of a system of things rather than people. Okay, last idea, Marx's theory of alienation that we see pop up in the economic manuscripts of 1844. Here, Marx argues that the capitalist system produces a state of alienation. The worker is estranged from the products of their labor, from the process of production and of making, from him or herself, and this one gets pretty philosophical. And finally, the worker is socially alienated from other human beings, and add to that from nature. All right, like I said at the outside of the video, this is just a primer. There's a lot more underneath the surface. If any of these ideas happen to resonate with you, you ought to grab a book or go online and read up on it and learn about it yourself. If you're following along in the Introduction to Pop Culture Studies playlist, just know that these concepts will serve as tools for thinking through our complex relationships with mass culture and society. So, that's it. We did it. I'm gonna be really honest with you, I went really hard in the editing department on this one, and I am exhausted. I am so glad that this video is done, I'm gonna go eat some chocolate and Google images of corgis. Last time to say this, please like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and take care.